here we go. It's part one of uh, chapter number six, and we're dealing with bone, bone tissue here. It's page 175. Um, the very beginning of the chapter is just a couple pages back here. Um, they're going to want us to understand bones in general, the skeletal tissues. Let's take a look here at this um, uh, sort of artistic rendition here of bone structure in the human body. <clears throat> And I want you to pay close attention to um, a couple of things. First of all, there's a change in color between the skull, the vertebra, ribs, sternum, um, all the way down to the, um, the sacrum and the coccyx. This gold color here is indicative of axial. Um, that is what they're trying to indicate, that this is the axial skeleton. And that upon uh, added to this can be limbs. So there are other chordata species that have um, a spinal column and a cord and so on, but they don't necessarily have um, extremities of any kind. Uh, snakes would be an example, eels or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so bear in mind that now we're going to have the addition of these other features growing out this way, and so we have this beige color for the um, extremities. And um, what else do I need you to understand here? First of all, in terms of weight bearing, this is a multicellular organism. It's big, it's 50 uh, trillion cells, uh, a lot of connective tissues, uh, matrices, uh, lots of water weight in the body. And so this is a, a very bulky, how shall I say, uh, sort of high uh, <laughs> uh, complex condominium uh, high-rise kind of situation here. So, um, and also the species here is unique in the sense that we're not four-legged animals, we're two-legged animals. And you'll notice that the weight is pressing down. It's pressing particularly in being, um, how shall I say, transformed from uniaxial to biaxial at this point right here. So there's some big features here that I need you to take a uh, close look at and examine what is a human being as compared to other uh, species, uh, even remotely or closely, either way, related. So um, compared to um, our pets at home, like cats and dogs, or uh, farm animals like uh, cows or horses, pigs, and so on, uh, we are not four-legged. As a result, those animals actually have this up here as the main weight-bearing feature. The girdle of the um, pectoral region is the main thing. Take a look at a uh, bison, for instance, and you'll see that the uh, bone structure up here is massive. And um, there's something that we're going to be referring to as Wolf's Law. Uh, bone matrix grows as a response to stress on the bone, which is weight-bearing and uh, the, how shall I say, the pull of muscles and so on uh, is going to increase uh, bone matrix in the direction and development of bone. Okay, Wolf's Law. So um, Wolf's Law has not had much of an effect here, as you can see, because we don't walk with our upper extremities. We walk with our lower extremities. And down here, we do have a very substantial girdle, uh, which is our pelvic girdle. And then these are uh, bones of significant strength and able to support weight and uh, provide locomotion. Uh, we do not use up here, uh, whenever we're involving uh, the individual with a cane or a crutch or something like this, um, or even sometimes riding a bicycle where the weight is borne um, for certain types of uh, uh, bike racers, road racers, is that they've leaned forward and they've put a lot of weight on their on their upper extremities. Not not a good idea uh, for homeostatic health. Okay, so I need you to understand that. I've pointed over here, I've identified axial, I'm sorry, uh, appendicular skeleton. Notice if you look really closely here that the um, appendicular skeleton begins with the clavicle and with the scapula. So if this person were to fall over and suddenly bear weight with an outstretched hand, which is sometimes uh, indicative of somebody taking a fall, then the entire weight of the body will be um, will be featured right here at that joint. This bone right here does not have a joint with the 
axial skeleton. It has a lot of muscle attachments, no uh, bony articulation. When I say articulation, I mean joint, right? You'll see there's a joint here with this long bone of the arm, but no joint with the axial skeleton. This, in fact, the uh, clavicle right here, does have a, an articulation, a joint. And so that means that the weight of the body will be right here. And this bone is commonly broken. The clavicle is a very commonly broken bone because it's not able to bear the weight of the body. Uh, in the uh, Tour de France, oftentimes you'll see somebody go over the handlebars in a, in a bad curve someplace, and uh, unfortunately they, they break that bone. Very common finding. Okay, so uh, we have those things uh, figured out. Now, the next thing I need you to take a quick look at is um, how do we build this tissue? And I gave you a, a good stress, bad stress before, I think. If I didn't, then let me just take a quick look here. Um, this is actually a handout that goes with Chapter 16, our endocrine, and has to do with uh, growth hormone. Pituitary growth hormone comes out at night in the first four hours of sleep. It, um, it will break down adipose tissue. Uh, it actually doesn't have a direct effect on muscle. I should revamp this diagram a little bit. Um, the liver does. Okay, so the liver actually has somatomedins, or as they say now, in modern times, um, growth, uh, uh, insulin-like growth factors. There's, a, there's hundreds of growth factors unique to the liver. Second four hours of sleep is where the liver is producing these uh, biosynthetic pathways are full on. We're making growth factors, and uh, we're developing the uh, skeletal tissues and muscle, um, and then we're uh, bone, uh, heart, lungs, all of the major organs, the skin, um, all of the skeletal characteristics here, all coming from the liver in the second four hours of sleep. So when I'm want to emphasize, re-emphasize, second four hours, which means there had to be a first four to get to the second four, if you know what I mean, uh, which indicates eight hours of sleep. There's a lot of people who claim that they can do well on six. Not the case. Uh, when it is actually um, looked at in sleep labs at UC Berkeley, no one, that is to say zero people um, of the thousands that have come through have ever had a good night's sleep a functional night's sleep on less than seven. There's deficit at less than seven, significant deficit at six, wild deficit at four. Okay, so um, wild meaning 70% of your immune system is gone. <laughs> it takes a lot to build an immune system. So um, keep that in mind. Um, sleep is powerful stuff. And uh, the road has to be shut down because the biosynthetic pathways are full on. Uh, let's take a quick look here at a more modern version of that diagram. That's right over here. And um, as you can see, we have growth hormone coming from the pituitary and then coming down to the liver and then coming down to um, everything to do with the skeletal, extra skeletal uh, tissues. The only thing that growth hormone is doing besides going to the liver is going uh, to fat metabolism and carbohydrate metabolism. It's requiring the, uh, the usage of cortisol. Um, when we use too much cortisol because we've been stressed out or we're sick or we have a physical injury of some kind, then um, the body is uh, sequestering a great deal of the uh, influence of growth hormone at night. Sleep is sequestered into repairing that which has been damaged or infected, so on. And that means that the rest of us don't get, doesn't get taken care of very well. It might take a few days to actually recover uh, full strength from um, being infected or having some sort of traumatic injury or being in for surgery of some kind or another. Okay, so let's slip back over here. And um, we're going to then pick up the action uh, with regard to um, uh, long bones, short bones. There's... Uh, one of the things that we're going to discover is that the growth patterns are quite different from one, sty one type of bone to another. Growth, long bones have a special growth pattern, and uh, the flat bones here, especially of the skull, of the ribs, and so on, um, and the vertebra, each have their own unique quality to them. Uh, but first, we have to um, figure out what's going on 
in terms of the um, the anatomy. So um, we're going to be taking a look here at this next picture, and we'll take a look at a the general anatomy of a long bone.